slain the blood of the Savior. When sin would separate, King Jesus made a way. The blood of the Savior, the blood of the Savior.
scripture says in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is the Lord's house, and we praise him with total praise today because he, he alone is worthy. He alone is holy. Would you stand and let's worship him together? an opportunity to greet those around you. Welcome to worship.
Well, happy Mother's Day, everybody. I hope if your mother is still living, you have already called her today, or you will before the day goes much further. And if she's already gone to heaven, I hope sometime today around the table, maybe you'll tell some stories about her and the influence she had on your life. A lot of folks are gone today because it's Mother's Day. They've gone home to be with mom, but I'm glad you're here. And we've got guests in the house and we're delighted always to welcome folks who come our way. In your program, there's a panel that asks some questions of you. And if you don't mind, fill that out for us. And then just neatly tear it. It comes right off. Hold on to it and put it in the offering plate at the end of the service today. You're in a warm and loving place. And our agenda today is to worship the Lord. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for each one who has come. We're in this room today together, or we're watching from distant lands because we want to offer unto you worthy praise. We pray, Lord, you would receive what we willingly give and that, Lord, you would in turn speak to us and draw us close to your side and instruct us for the days to come. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us? Let's continue to worship. We will. 
Casey and Christine and Olivia, beautiful, beautiful music. It's been an exciting week for our church, a lot of things going on. Our group that went down to Mississippi on a mission project, they returned midweek, having had a successful trip. Yesterday, our teenagers were involved in a local ministry of service, and we commend them for that. Friday night here at church, we had... Uh, one of our teenagers received his Eagle Scout Award. We had a ceremony here, Jacob Foster. When you see him, you ought to commend him for that. Our bell choir went out to Nationals Park to play the uh, national anthem and got rained out of all things, but they were ready. And then yesterday morning, one of my favorite people, Ella Murray, had a book signing at Barnes and Noble at Potomac Yards. Can you imagine that? She didn't write the book. The book is about her. So she and the author were there selling books and signing autographs. So Ella's got a sore hand today because she signed a lot of autographs yesterday. So good things, good things happening. But it's also been a week of difficulty for many of you and many of our people. Uh, starting today, I want us to have on Sundays regularly a time of prayer for each other. That's part of what being a community of faith is all about. And when we do this, I'm going to invite you to come and stand here at the front with me. If you have a sickness, if there's something weighing on your soul, or you know somebody who's battling an illness, I hope somebody will come up here today and stand for Carol Lynch who's in the hospital and not doing good. I hope some teenager or other will come and stand up here for Jack Passeau, who's wrestling with cancer. Or maybe you've got a family situation or you're trying to make a decision and you just want us to pray. I'll pray, but I want you to come as a symbol of your need of God's touch. So right now, would you come and join me, please? Anyone who needs prayer today. on in, we can make room.
Maybe nobody knows your situation but you and God. But still, we can pray together for his will to be done. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you invite us to pray. And you promise that if we pray, you will hear our prayer. We ask, Lord, for these who are dealing with serious illness, that you touch their bodies miraculously through doctors, through medicine, or apart from all of that. We pray for healing and comfort for those who grieve, those dealing with a problem at home or at work, and they need your intervention. I pray you would do so. And for our dear church, that you would guide us in these days that we might know your will and do it. Well, we don't know how it's all going to pan out, but we do trust you, and we lay these requests at your throne of mercy. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can go back to your seats. Mary Spangler, I want you to stay up here. Join me on the platform. You're a mother, and I spotted you in the crowd. <laughs> you have three lovely daughters, Cammy and Bryce and Bailey. Thank you. And you've got a mother, and I, I know your mother. I've, I knew her before I knew you That's right. in Danville, Virginia. Tell us about your mom. Well, she's an incredible, godly woman. She's just a good role model. And, um, you know, back in the old days, they got married a little bit younger than they do now. She was 15 years old when she married my dad. 15? <laughs> It'll never last. <laughs> Did it last? 62 years now, plus, and they're still together. I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so virtually all her life, she's been a pastor's wife, and she's also been a, an elementary school teacher. She's retired now, but she was an elementary school teacher and a librarian and, of course, a wonderful mother. What did you learn about the faith from your mother? Well, my mother mainly taught by just role modeling, and she was a wonderful role model of her faith. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, you know, the Bible tells us not to worry, and I'm a worrier. I still struggle with that. <laughs> but my mother has never been one to worry, and uh, she's a three-time survivor of cancer. And um, every time she had cancer, her attitude was, you know, if the Lord takes this cancer away from my body and lets me stay on this earth a few more years, I'll just glorify his name. But if it's time for me to go, I'm ready to go. Hmm. That's great. Well, you have your daughters now, and they're pretty much grown. But did, did your mother's mothering impact you and what did you learn from her about that? Well, I mean, growing up as a pastor's daughter and, you know, my mother's daughter, they made sure that we stayed in church. And um, she also made sure that I was surrounded by other godly women mentoring me that I could learn from. And that's one thing I'm so thankful for here at this church is there's so many um, women here that have mentored my girls and many of them are sitting out here right now and you know who you are. I'm not going to start calling names because I'll miss somebody, but um, just the wonderful godly women in this church. I can't thank you enough for helping us raise our children. We came, when we came here, some of the girls were little, and they're, none of them are little anymore. In fact, uh, our oldest one is moving to Florida tomorrow. So, Well, have you called your mom today? I haven't yet, but I will. Okay, be sure you do that. <laughs> I will. And, and tell her hello for me. I sure will. And for all of us at First Baptist. And I would like to add that she is just the most wonderful um, uh, just the embodiment of a Proverbs 31 woman. She's just amazing. Well, in honor of your mother, I'll read Proverbs 31 okay. in a few minutes in the sermon, okay? Let's thank Mary for sharing. Thank you. And now take your copy of Scripture and turn to Ephesians. We're still there and uh, not going to be there very much longer. I've enjoyed this study, and I hope it's been helpful for you. Ephesians, today, chapter 5, and we come to verse 22 and following. Paul's entering a new section in the letter where he's going to be dealing with family life, 
marriage, family, parenting, and then he'll get into the office with us and how we conduct ourselves at work. So it's a very, very practical section. And so I hope you'll come every week and be a part of that study. We're looking at verses 22 to 24 today, but so you get the context, and you're going to need the context on this one. We'll read the rest of the chapter. It's up on the screen, but you follow along. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Whoever, however, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. At this point, we're not sure, is he he mainly talking about the church and using marriage as an example, or is he mostly writing about marriage and using the church as an example? He's talking to us about both. And this is why our understanding of marriage in the 21st century is so important. Folks are trying to redefine it. We must not do that because it's all related to our understanding of the church, our understanding of God's plan for the universe. So today, I'm not talking to all women. I'm talking to wives about being Christian wives. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Back in the uh, mid-1970s, 1974, the number one bestseller in the nonfiction section of the New York Times book of of, uh, reviews, the number one book was a book by Maribel Morgan entitled The Total Woman. Anybody here read that book back in the 70s? You can admit it if you did. It was a Christian book. And uh, Maribel Morgan's uh, position was that if you're going to be a happy wife, you just keep your husband happy. I don't see a problem with that. She, but she made that point. And uh, just do whatever he wants. That's not illegal or immoral. Do whatever he wants and he'll be happy and you'll be happy. Uh, the, most, the thing everybody remembers about the book is that she advised wives at the end of the day when their husband is coming home to greet him at the door wearing nothing but cellophane. And that was shocking, especially because it was a Christian book. I remember being shocked by that. But I did buy a copy of it for Audrey because... <laughs> I just thought it would, it would be something she would enjoy. I don't know that she ever read it, however. <laughs> but the other day I was in the kitchen and I opened the drawer where we keep the saran wrap and there it was. <laughs> that was Maribel Morgan. Now, what does the Bible say about being a successful Christian wife? What's it all about? Paul takes the the code of conduct for marriages that was already well entrenched, and he raises it to a new level. He keeps the structure, but he changes the attitude. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebration of Discipline, says that this was a culture that already completely understood and practiced the subservience of wives to their husbands. This was the family structure. So it wasn't shocking at all when when wives read verse 22, they just kind of just kind of roll their eyes. It was their life. 
What Paul does, though, is he takes that situation and he elevates a wife's position in the family to the degree that he tells her, you've got a choice here. Society says this is the way you've got to conduct your marriage. You've got a choice. And God wants you, God wants you to submit to the leadership of your husband and love him and and be his partner. Wives have freedom, and that's what Paul is saying. We don't hear it that way. We, we see something else there. But it was a beautiful, beautiful... The, the, the controversial section of this passage is not verse 22. It's verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That was revolutionary. Wives were already submitting, but husbands, what did they know about loving and about sacrificing themselves for their wives, that was unheard of. But this is God's plan for the Christian family. The wife, as I understand the totality of Old and New Testament, the wife is a full and equal partner in marriage with her husband. You're not second class. You're not in a secondary role. Full and equal partner in this marriage. And if your marriage is to last 60 plus years the way Mary's parents have lasted, it's got to be that way. Equal partners. I get that from Genesis. Way back, page two in your Bibles. First, there's Adam. He's all by himself. God says in chapter two of Genesis verse 18, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper exactly right for him, suitable for him. Now, I know what that word helpful sounds like. It sounds like it's all about him and uh, you are the helper. You're the apprentice. You're the person that lags behind and, and picks up after. You're the help. But that same word, helper, is used in another place in the Bible for God himself. God is our help and our strength. It's not secondary. It's primary. It's very, very important. So I don't want you to stumble over the word submit in verse 22. Actually, to be very honest with you, the word submit doesn't even appear in verse 22. I know it's there in your English text, but you may find it written in italics. That means translators added it for clarity. It is, it is meant there, but the word isn't there. The word is in verse 21. So the translators just moved it on down for clarity. Look up at verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that concludes a section about being filled with the Spirit. That's a section about how we're to treat one another in the church. It's written not to wives. It's written to everybody. Submit to one another. Put yourself under. Defer to others. Wives, for example, to your husbands. That's the meaning of the way it's written there. We're all supposed to submit. And we do it every day in so many different ways. And in the home, wives are instructed to submit to their husbands. Now, we bristle at that. And we immediately want to throw it out along with sundials and our eight-track tape collections as no longer being relevant to our day. But we must not do that. There are those who think a verse like this perpetuates the oppression of women. But it doesn't properly understood. What does the word not mean? We've all seen it distorted, and some men, if they don't know any other verse of the Bible, they know verse 22, and they're, they're constantly quoting it, and they're throwing it into the face of their wives. This is not a verse a man can use to order you to do something. It is a word a wife understands as a voluntary response. It does not mean subservience. It doesn't mean blind obedience to a despotic dictator. And it certainly doesn't mean that you stay in a relationship where you are being physically or verbally abused. And I know there are preachers who preach it that way, that no matter what, you've made your bed, now lie in it, and you stay there even though you and the life of your children are at stake. No, 
God wants us to have some common sense, too. It doesn't mean that. Submit means respect and deference. He comes back to that down in verse 33. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must, he doesn't say submit this time, he says respect her husband. It's a voluntary response that comes from your commitment to Jesus. You do this, now you're free, you know. You're not, you're not in the first century, and you're not under that old system where it was understood. You're free. Now you do it voluntarily out of your commitment to Christ. You give up your right to always have it your way. You can't always get what you want, the song says. And so you voluntarily give up your rights. Now, Jesus modeled this for us. Do you remember Philippians chapter 2, one of the most famous passages in the Bible? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have the same attitude that Jesus had, who being in, the, in reality God, did not hold on to that, grasp that, but laid all that aside and humbled himself and came to the earth, became a servant and went all the way to the cross for us. What was he doing? He was modeling real submission. And that's what God has called us to do. Down in chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents. It's a different word than the word submit up in verse 21 and implied in verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. That word head there is variously translated. The, the different Greek lexicons have 25 or more meanings of that word. Words like uh, source or top or brim or origin mouth like the mouth of a river, starting point. And we know from Genesis that's exactly how it was. First there was man alone, and then came Eve. She came from his side. But authority is not really one of the best translations of that word. So it's not a position of subservience. It is a position of deference and respect. And again, Jesus is the model. Turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And look at verse 42. And this uh, passage is not about marriage. It's about everything. It applies to marriage. It applies to you at work and in every relationship you have. Chapter 10, verse 42. Jesus called them together and he said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Now, that person still has a role, a position. He's the commanding officer. Uh, she is the boss at work. The husband is the leader at home, all of that. But something's different. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what does submit mean? It, it means that you willingly, voluntarily, it can't be coerced from you, willingly, voluntarily, you give deference and respect. You give your husband space to be the leader. Maybe he's not the leader now. Maybe you've not been letting him be the leader. And if you don't let him, he can't do it. Let him be the spiritual leader of your home. Most of the time, this is not going to be an issue. Most of the time, you'll discuss. You'll play to each other's strengths where your partner knows more about a thing. She'll lead where he knows more about it. He'll lead. You'll compromise so that both of you are happy. But there will be those times, maybe not many, but there will be those times when compromise is not possible. 
And a decision has to be made. And it's got to be made by 12 o'clock. So what do you do? I think the scripture is telling us, husband, take the leadership. And wife, willingly, pleasantly submit to that leadership. Audra and I were raised on this, and it was never an issue. I mean, we struggle like everybody else, but 11 and a half years ago, we struggled at this point. It was when you were inviting me to come and be pastor here. Both of us knew that it was God's will and that he had been preparing us all of our lives for this ministry assignment, but she wasn't happy about it. She loved her job. She loved the house we lived in. She loved our church. They loved us. We were content to stay there the rest of our lives, but God called. And she said, I'll go, Don. I don't want to, but I will go. And so we came, but it, that wasn't, it wasn't over because for the first several months we were here, she was very unhappy. She missed everything she had had back home. And we spent many late nights crying and talking. And finally, one night, I said, Audrey, okay, I hear you. And I want you to be happy more than I want anything else. So I'm going to defer to you. I'm going to submit to you in this matter. And uh, I'll resign the church, and we'll go back to Danville. They haven't gotten a pastor yet. They'd be glad to have us back. We'll just go right back into that life. And when she heard that, things began to change. She knew how highly I esteemed her and how I was willing to submit, and so she was willing to. Now, let me just hasten to say, she's very happy now because <laughs> I see some concerned looks on you. She's very, she's never been happier now than she is now. But that was our struggle. So this is very real to me. It's mutual submission, but... When push comes to shove, let the husband lead. Now, don't ignore your unique responsibilities that you have as a wife. You have some unique responsibilities. Now, I know this has changed, too. In the 21st century, uh, we're doing a whole lot of things differently than they did in the first century. But the Scripture says there are basically three uh, responsibilities you have. Number one, to meet the legitimate needs of your husband to meet the legitimate needs of your husband, the needs only you can meet as his wife, to give him self-confidence, to build up his self-esteem, to make him whole. That goes back to Genesis. It's not good for man to be alone. Something's missing. I'll make a partner exactly right for him. And when Adam woke up and there was Eve beside him, he said, wow, this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. She's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. For this reason, a man leaves father and mother, cleaves to his wife, and the two become one flesh to make you whole. And sexual needs, very, very real, very important. You're the only one who can do that. Cover story of today's New York Times magazine. It seems to be promoting open marriage. You've got your wife, but you can, you can have other women in your life, other men in your life. And it's all above board. Everybody knows about it. So that uh, through the collection of these people, you have your needs met. That's never been God's way. That's another way folks are trying to redefine marriage. It's a man and a woman for life meeting each other's needs. But that's your responsibility. Number two, to manage the home. To manage the home. Read Proverbs 31 when you get home today. It's often quoted at Mother's Day. Or the funeral of a mother. It's a beautiful portrait of the ideal woman. And I don't know that anybody ever lived up to it totally. But it describes a woman who's a businesswoman. And she's articulate. And she's, uh, she stays up half the night. You understand that. And uh, she gets everything done. And she takes care of the house. She manages her home. Now she's got servant girls. So husbands think about that. She's got people helping her. But she takes that responsibility. And then a third responsibility is to mother the children. To mother the children. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 says, We were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. Uh, yesterday, or the night before, I, I, I was coming in, and uh, as I approached our front door, just as I got to the door, a bird flew from the reef that was hanging, the springtime reef, hanging on our door. Almost hit me in the face. And I thought to mention that to Audrey yesterday, and she said, oh, no, birds are going to tear up my wreath. So she went to the door and looked in the wreath, and uh, she said, Don, come here, come here. I thought we were going to see eggs, but it's beyond that. Little baby birds. And the mom is there until we open the door, and then the mother flies away. But I'm careful on approach now <laughs> because that mother's very, very protective. Mother's mother the children and everything I am and everything you are probably is due to mom. One more thing in the midst of all of this submitting and, and all the rest, don't forget to take care of yourself. Don't forget to take care of yourself. You're a person in your own right. You're not just a half of something. You're a whole of something. So take care of yourself. I want you to turn over to 1 Peter, or it'll be up on the screen. You can see it. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair, wearing of gold, jewelry, and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. You want to be beautiful. He's not saying here you can't wear fine clothes or take care of your hair or wear jewelry. He's not saying that, but keep it, keep it in perspective. It's more important that you give attention to your soul, that you be beautiful on the inside, because Physical beauty will fade eventually. But that inner beauty just goes on and on and on. Give attention to that. Don't become bitter. Don't be negative. Embrace life and the joy of living as a Christian woman and make yourself beautiful. And, and when you are, it will show from your face. It will show from the glow on your face. Now, I'm going to get to the men in a couple of weeks, so don't give up. Come on back. But let me jump ahead. Men, let me give you one word of advice. Your wife wants to be beautiful. She wants to be beautiful on the inside and on the outside. Here's where you come in. And I'll just ask it as a question. What would your wife's concept of herself be? How she views her beauty, how she views her competence, her skill, her sense of humor, her, her wisdom. What would her concept of herself be if it was totally dependent on what you said to her this morning or this weekend? Because she gets it from you. She understands who she is by how you speak to her and treat her. So make her beautiful on Mother's Day. I want us to bow together. In a moment, we're going to sing. I'm going to be at the front of the room. And if today you would say, I want to be a part of a church like this, we invite you to step into the aisle and come to where I'm standing and present yourself. Just come to me. If you are a Christian, but you've not been baptized, you ought to be, and we'll do it in weeks to come, but you need to come and let us know. Or if today, this very day, you would give your life to Christ, you step out and come and tell me so. Let's stand and we will sing together.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for motherhood. All our lives have been touched by mothers in some way. It's the hardest job that there is, Lord. So we ask for your blessing in all the mothers here today. And we also thank you for your loving kindness and your perfect design for families, Lord. Even though we haven't always lived in accordance with that perfect design, your grace overwhelms all of us. And it is in that fashion that we thank you for your grace that we may give just a small token of that grace back to you for the furtherance of your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.